Welcome to Taste Buds. I'm Deborah Eckerling, goal strategist, writer, and foodie. And today I'm speaking with cookbook author June Hirsch, who focuses on preserving food, memory, and history. And I'm so excited to talk to you because, well, <laughs> we both obviously love food, but also that connection of food to memory, history, and community, it's so important. It's uh, to me, it's vital. I, I, I started using now on um, my Instagram feed a line that really I, my next book should just be titled it without the story. It's just ingredients. And I truly feel that the connection, especially with Jewish food, the stories that are built around the foods that we eat, that we cherish, that have nourished and nurtured us for so many decades and centuries have such a wonderful provenance. They just have a great story behind them. And I think that's what makes them so especially satisfying. Completely agree. So, but uh, how, uh, how did you come into this niche? I mean, <laughs> is, is it always, do you've loved food? I mean, clearly it's in the DNA, but where, where did this very specific niche come from for you? Well, it's, it's interesting. I have always cooked. I've always eaten. Um, I came from uh, what I call a mix, uh, mixed marriage. My mother is Ashkenazi. My father is Sephardic. And um, I think that gave me the benefit of really being exposed to two very different types of Jewish cuisine. Most of my friends, they were raised on matzo ball soup and potato latkes. And I'm going to say what I call the usual beige food that comes out of a typical Ashkenazi kitchen. Nothing wrong with it. I love it. I make it. I raised my children on it. But it was really fun to have that other aspect of cooking in my life. And that came from my father's side of the family, his, uh, his dad my, and my great grandmother, who I knew very well. Um, they came from the Isle of Rhodes. And my grandmother brought with her some just absolutely fabulous Sephardic dishes. And it made our house so unique during the holidays, especially I'm gonna say at Passover more than any other time because we were allowed to eat foods that my friends were not allowed to eat because rice and beans were part of our Passover Sephardic traditions. Now I think it's actually permitted even in conservative households. But in my home, they were always on the table. And so while my friends were eating chopped liver at their Seder, we were having matzo meat cakes, which is, you know, this beautiful sandwich of, of golden matzo with a slowly simmered beef and onions. It's, it's just a wonderful dish. So I think that helped develop my appreciation for a broad spectrum of foods. We also traveled a lot when I was young. We were importers. We were in the lighting business. And it exposed me to a lot of different types of foods. And my mother was a typical holiday cook. And my father was an amazing weekend cook. And he was, it was more exotic. It, it was really very involved in complex dishes. He's almost 97 and he still cooks to this day. And he's still an accomplished cook. So that's where my background came from as far as uh, cooking and uh, what I enjoy eating. As far as writing goes, that came about really much later in life. And um, that was when uh, we sold our family business back in 2004. And my sister said to me, we did well, now let's do good. And I was trying to think what my good was going to be. And that's when I approached the Museum of Jewish Heritage to write a cookbook. That was my first foray into food writing, and it's just been a delicious ride ever since. That is such a good story. So your food background is a food story in and of itself. <laughs> it, 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 what's nice about it is, in, in you know, we, we had, as I said, the traditional foods, but my mother was, you know, making tongue uh, on, on a typical Wednesday night. Most of my friends did not eat pickled tongue, but... But I did. And um, my father was making these wonderfully exotic dishes and plating chicken a la king and tetrazzinis and, and what he called livers maurice and, and all these really wonderful dishes at a time where most fathers were not cooking. You didn't find most fathers in the 50s and 60s in the kitchen. And I had that nice 
exposure and almost a little bit of role reversal in that way that my dad was actually the the more accomplished cook. My mom was the more the traditional cook, made a mean brisket and and a matzo ball that would sit with you for all eight nights of Passover. It was when we used to kid, you knew Passover was over when you passed my mother's first matzo ball. That was when the holiday officially ended. So it was it was always an, an interesting combination of foods. It was it was a lot of fun. It was a great household to grow up in from a, especially from a culinary aspect. So we know why you love food so much and Jewish food so much, but why do you think everybody does? Oh, well, what's not to like? Right. I mean, you know, when, when I wrote, I, I had a book came, came out um, in February, Iconic New York Jewish Food. And originally I was going to title it Iconic New York Food That Happens to be Jewish. Because when I was beginning to write the book, I realized that aside from, honestly, a small handful of foods, most of the dishes that are the most crave-worthy in New York, that people travel across the country to sample, that line up on a weekend to, to taste and savor, happen to be Jewish foods. And that's why there's a line outside of Katz's Deli. And that's why Yona Schimmel's, you know, potato knishes are still the best in the city. And Russ and Daughters knows how to hand slice that salmon like no one else. These are not just Jewish foods. They're foods that really everybody loves and associates with New York lifestyle and New York culture. So as a born and bred New Yorker, and a New York Jewish child and homemaker and mother and now grandmother, I find that those are the foods that still remain in my repertoire and the foods that I wanted to write about and the, the foods that everybody wants to eat. So I hate to make you play favorites, but I'm going to. <laughs> Is there one dish that's like the, the epitome of the iconic Jewish food? So I'm going to probably say that if you give me a good, crisp hot dog on a roll with mustard and do not put ketchup on it, because that is an insult to the hot dog world, um, that's probably, I, I, I love biting into that good, crisp snap. And you know why you get that snap? You get the snap because the casing that's on the hot dog, if it's a, an old fashioned, traditionally made hot dog, it's a natural casing. And that casing shrinks as it cooks. And so it's really, it's, it's like, you know, uh, trying to, you know, put somebody in a, a size six pair of skinny jeans that should be wearing a 10. And so now all of a sudden you hear that pop and that's that just fabulous snap that, you know, that it tells you that's a, that's a great hot dog. Uh, it's um, yeah, to me, that's a good iconic New York food. It has a great New York story also. And I know what is that? I know. I knew I got to tell it. So back in the day in Coney Island in the 1920s, you had this man, Charles Feltman. Now, nobody knows Charles Feltman. It's not a name that, you know, everybody uh, toasts at their uh, July 4th barbecue. But Charles Feltman was very clever. He was a immigrant who came here to this country. He had a push cart that was on the beaches of Coney Island and he was selling hot dogs. And what he decided was it would be so much easier if there was a better vehicle for the hot dog than a plate with a fork and a knife. Because A, that ties up both your hands. B, that cost him extra money. He had to supply cutlery and a plate. So he devised the hot dog roll. And he now had a wheelwright who are the people who made the push carts and they devised a push cart for him that had one side with a charcoal grill for the hot dogs and the other side that could steam the buns. And he began selling them in his store, in his restaurant on the beach, which became an empire. He was the largest restaurant really across the country. He served more people than any other single establishment. And his big mistake was one of his grill masters who sliced the buns was very shrewd. And he went into competition 
And his last name was Handworker. Again, not a name that most people know. And he undercut Feltman's hot dogs by half. So instead of selling them for a dime, he sold them for a nickel. And he got the uh, doctors and the nurses from the nearby hospital to come dressed in their hospital garb so that it had the image of being a very healthy food. And he gave them free hot dogs. Two of his friends were Eddie Cantor and Jimmy Durante. They also worked at the restaurant. And he built his own empire. And instead of naming it for his wife, Ida, whose recipe he used, he named it for himself. And his first name was Nathan. And that was how Nathan started. He was a bun slicer in the empire of Charles Feltman. You can't make these stories up. And he became known as Nathan's Famous because Sophie Tucker, who was now a friend with Jimmy Durante and Eddie Cantor, began singing his praises. And one of them said, you know, Nathan, you're famous. And that now became their tagline, Nathan's Famous. So hot dogs are such a richly New York. I know Chicago, you have your own dog. And upstate New York, you prepare your white hots. In Michigan, you've got them as well. But there's something about a Coney Island Frank that just has its roots in, in, in the sands of Coney Island. I, I feel it epitomizes New York. And I grew up in the Chicago suburbs. I live in LA now. So you say a hot dog and I am, I am totally with you on that, that whole history. And my mom grew up in the, in the Detroit area and they have their own. So uh, you don't think of a hot dog as Jewish, but a hot dog apparently is totally Jewish. That is correct. It is, you know, listen, a sausage, people just don't associate sausage and Jewish. They, they don't go hand in hand. But a sausage is basically any food that's ground and, and put in a casing. So a hot dog is a sausage. And when the Jewish immigrants came to America in the, you know, main influx starting in the 1880s, they brought with them these traditions of sausage making. At first, they were not all kosher beef sausages. Most of the sausage makers were Germans, not necessarily German Jews, and they weren't kosher sausages. But then the Jewish immigrants began to develop their own methods, and um, Isaac Gellis became a household name and Hebrew national, and and these were the forerunners of of the hot dog industry in America. Uh, actually, it's funny, one of Hot God Dog's favorite friends, Baked Beans, was actually the first commercial food that uh, carried the um, hetcher for kosher from the uh, Orthodox Union. So there's a, a lot of synergy here between Franks and Beans and, and Jewish New York. Wow, amazing. And this is why I love these conversations is because we came into this thinking we were going to talk about other foods. And I just love this hot dog digression. Um, and we also have to mention, so your dog's name's Malamar. So it of is. course, Malamar is a treat. So it, is your life, does it just revolve around food, which is totally. <laughs> is it okay to say, it? I'll start out. It revolves around my grandchildren and my grandchildren's association with me probably revolves around food. So I will say that is most likely the center of my universe. Right now you're in my, my kitchen where uh, I, I'd like to think the magic happens. And it is like everyone's home, whether you have a grand kitchen or when I cook in New York City in a space that is barely large enough for me to turn around and not bump both walls. It's the heart of the home. And I think for most cultures, not just Jewish, but for most cultures, food is just that thread that takes us from our past and brings us into our present. And hopefully we weave it into the lives of our children and grandchildren so it carries forward to our future, which is why the, the idea to me of preserving food memory Again, I focus on my traditions, but it's as important to me when, when I wrote a book, uh, we were talking earlier off camera about yogurt. I wrote a book called The Global History of Yogurt, totally off brand for me, but I, I loved writing it because I got to delve into the, literally the culture of the Indian culture and the Southeast Asian culture and, and the French culture and others who really covet the art of making yogurt. And 
to me, this is, this is the beauty of food. It is, it tastes so much better when we know where it came from and how it connects us to the next person in our family, in our community, in our lives. And I, I think that's, food is just so communal for that reason. I am completely with you. And I love, and and so I introduced myself on the show as goal strategist, writer, and foodie. So I wrote a book called Your Goal Guide. Um, I'm a freelance writer. I'm a workshop leader. But this love of food, I have managed to let it infiltrate all the different things that I do. So I, I do cooking for productivity workshops and I'm a food writer. So all of the things that we love when they revolve around food, it's just so easy it to is. bring them out because it's like, it's like the easiest conversation ever yeah. can start with, with food. Yes. I will tell you that the best example of that came with the book that I wrote, my first book, when I wanted to do good for the Museum of Jewish Heritage and began writing. And it was called Recipes Remembered a Celebration of Survival. And in it, I interviewed over 100 Holocaust survivors. And I recreated their recipes and I retold their stories. And that book is being totally refreshed and it's been given a little bit of a facelift. Uh, it has a beautiful forward written by global citizen and master chef Daniel Baloud. So I am honored that he chose to write the forward for this book. And in it, I found number one, that we laughed more than we cried that the conversation about food was such a wonderful, natural starting place to discuss the life history of these Holocaust survivors of this remarkable community. And in their sharing with me the how their lives were thrown from comfort to chaos, I realized that the moment we began talking about food, it brought them back to this amazing, happy place. It brought them back to their kitchens before the war, uh, celebrating Shabbat with their family, uh, recognizing that the last Passover they had together was the last Passover they would ever have together. And yet, as we discussed the food, smiles returned to their faces. Their bodies relaxed their hands became unclenched. You could see that this was a comforting, safe place. That's what food does for people. It brings them, it centers them, and it brings them to a really good place in their lives. And it helps them tie their past and move forward as well. And um, in in the new book, it's uh, it'll be out this November called Food, Hope, and Resilience. It is remarkable how the stories that they shared with me and the messages that they impart are ever so much more vital today than they've ever been. And how we are returning to so many of the foods that they told me and that they prepared as, as children with their families. These are now dishes that are becoming commonplace in some of our more trendier restaurants because we're getting back to that really basic, straightforward um, I'm going to say organically natural food. And that's what they were raised on. And that's what the book features. So it's, it was really fun to be able to revisit it and, um, and, and, and shine a whole new light on it again and, and give it a little bit of a, of a new start. I love that. And, and really just the fact that joy and food can come out of pain and drama is it's really just <laughs> enough said, right? Yeah. What's more healing than that? Exactly. So I love, for, and, and I know we discussed you sharing another recipe, but I feel like we should share something. What is a good, easy recipe that goes well with hot dogs? It's, it's not particularly Jewish, but I make a mean onion ring. <laughs> and it goes great with a hot dog. And it's so easy. Just dip it in a nice little tempura batter made with beer. And... Um, and fry those babies up. And I have to tell you, that's that's really a pretty good combination. Or 
go ahead and, and pickle your own cucumbers and have yourself a nice half sour. It doesn't even have to be a full sour. Um, of course, you have to pop open a Dr. Brown soda because not to do so would be a Shonda, but, um, but it, it all goes together. It just all ties in. Wonderful. Well, send me any and all the recipes and we will be sure to put it in the recap on jewishjournal.com. And if you go to jewishjournal.com slash podcast, you can get the recap, the recipes, and also see the other episodes of Taste Buds. Well, this has been not only a wonderful conversation, but kind of a surprising one because I love we went in this direction. So thank you. June, where can people learn more about you and your books? Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I am desperately trying to break into Instagram. I am posting like a crazy woman. So if you enjoy any of what I had to say, I'd love you to follow me at June Hirsch. And uh, you can visit my website, junehirsch.com. Uh, there I, I post uh, information and updates. We're starting to book our book talks for the fall and winter. So I'm, I'm hoping that if uh, you have an organization or a synagogue or a living room uh, that you want to loan me, I will come and talk endlessly. As you can see, I, I have no trouble making, making a conversation. And the nice thing is, is that since day one with Recipes Remembered and continuing through iconic New York Jewish food, which benefits New York's Met Council, Food, Hope and Resilience. Also, the proceeds go to support Holocaust education. This is a charitable endeavor on my part. And so when I do a book talk, your organization benefits. Uh, nothing in this kitchen benefits. You benefit. Organizations and synagogues and Holocaust groups benefit from it. So um, it's, it's my little way of uh, allowing you to eat well and do good. And uh, that's kind of become my mantra. And um, I hope you'll support me in that endeavor. I, and I noticed you had eat well, do good in your signature on your email, which is I, I'm all about the mission and motto. And there's <laughs> nothing um, more clear, concise, and enriching than that. So. And I'm going to show you that I also have it on my wall, <laughs> right behind where we're sitting, along with some images of some of my writings. But it is, it is really, um, it has become what I think is a, a good way to accomplish charitable activities is through food. Why not? Well, I, I suspected you were my people, and now I know this to be true. Thanks. So thank you so much, June Hirsch, for joining me today, for sharing your love of all things food, Jewish food, history, and memory. And thank you for tuning in to Taste Buds with Deb. Don't miss an episode. You can subscribe on YouTube and or your favorite podcast platform. And go to jewishjournal.com slash podcast to get recipes and read the articles that go with each episode. And you can learn more at tastebudswithdeb.com. Until next time, bon appetit.